This Sunday, we will have the opportunity to confess our faith in the words of the Athanasian Creed, a laudable custom in our Missouri Synod Lutheran congregations. How old this custom is, I cannot say, but it has become a hallmark of Trinity Sunday. No synod or council has dictated its use among us, but it has organically become part of the people's piety. I imagine there would be a groundswell uprising if a pastor omitted it. That is a wonderful thing. Its use throughout other parts of Christendom is varied. It does not have the agreed-upon use like that of the Nicene or Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed being prescribed for services of Holy Communion, and the Apostles, the Baptismal Creed, and the Daily Creed of the House and Home. The specified use of the Athanasian Creed in the Roman Catholic Church was by monks and nuns on Sunday mornings before church. This may still be their practice. It was the case in the Middle Ages. The Church of England prescribed its use in morning prayer 13 times a year, around once a month, therefore. In a conversation this week from a man in the area, I was told of its use also in certain Reformed churches, as well as a text this man was describing for his catechism class. Not in the Lutheran church, but in the Reformed church. My collective observations from other churches, though, has shown that its use is becoming more infrequent, likely because of its length, likely also because of the condemnatory clauses which pass damnation on all who do not confess the truth of the stated doctrine, and also as to this fact, that originally the Athanasian Creed's use was to train pastors, not laity, in the true doctrine of the Trinity. Whether it is used or not used, what is most important is that pastors teach and preach correctly about the doctrine of the Trinity, which they can do with or without the use of this creed. Nonetheless, its use among us is a powerful way to remind us yearly of the importance of the teaching of the Holy Trinity. I have considered also adding it to our worship on Christmas morning. If I get enough votes at the end of the service, I might just do it. That the Athanasian Creed would be fitting to speak on Christmas is today's real point. Because in addition to the teaching of the Trinity, the Athanasian Creed regards the understanding of the incarnation of our Lord as also essential for faith and salvation. The second section of the Creed begins with the words that you just spoke, but it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus. The word incarnation comes from the word meat, chili con carne, Chini, chili with meat, we get the word there, there as well. So the word incarnation merely refers to the fact that Christ took on human flesh. Verse 28 summarizes the essence of what will be elaborated in the remainder of the creed with these simple words. Therefore, it's the right faith that we believe and confess simply that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He's God, begotten, of the fa- begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man. In summary, that is all this section of the Creed is trying to say. In addition to confessing and worshiping the Trinity, which we discussed in the first half of the Creed, we must also confess the incarnation of the Son of God. On September 1st, in the year 1537, Martin Luther addressed the saints at Wittenberg while the town pastor was away. He said these words 
to the congregation as he preached on the first chapter of John, which we read tonight. Luther said to his congregants assembled there in the town church, he said, the following tale is told about a coarse and brutal lout. While the words, and was made man, were being sung in church, they used to sing the creed, he, this man, remained standing, neither genuflecting nor removing his hat. He showed no reverence, but just stood there like a clod. All the others dropped to their knees when the Nicene Creed was prayed and chanted devoutly. Then the devil stepped up to him and hit him so hard it made his head spin. He cursed him gruesomely and said, May hell consume you, you boorish ass. If God had become an angel like me, and the congregation saying, God was made an angel, I would bend not only my knees, but my whole body to the ground. Yes, I would crawl ten L's down into the ground. And you vile human creature, you stand there like a stick or a stone. You hear that God did not become an angel, but a man like you, and you just stand there like a stick of wood. Luther continues, whether this story is true or not, it is nevertheless in accordance with the faith. With this illustrative story, the Holy Fathers wish to admonish the youths to revere the indescribably great miracle of the Incarnation. They wanted us to open our eyes wide and ponder these words well. An unforgettable quote of Martin Luther. Did you ever notice that the pastor either genuflects or bows at the point in the liturgy in the Nicene Creed when the words, and was made man, are confessed? Whence and how this tradition arose, I do not know, but it is a very ancient custom. We bow the knee at this great mystery, that God would humble himself in such a way for us, forever raising our nature and elevating our status to the heavenlies. As the hymn we just sang will say, will, will say in the concluding verses, if God joined thee to him, how greatly he must love thee. Christ united himself to your person, that he might experience your life, live faithfully on your behalf, and take and die for your sins. This is the greatest news. God became man. To protect this doctrine, the teaching of the atonement, that on one hand, Christ's death would pay the price for our sins, for if he was only man, it would not, and that Christ could die, and if he was only God, he could not die. We step back in this section to confess what the Scripture says would take for that to happen. And while there are many heresies and statements behind the words of this section of the Creed, the various ideas are presented here simply to you in the following points that I will make, the general consensus of what this section of the Creed is stating. You'll be able to follow some of this. If you don't get everything, just put it away for future reference. The first point I'll make in the, is this. The Creed wants to say that it was not that humanity became God, but that God took up and assumed the humanity into himself. There was not a changing of the Godhead, for God cannot change, but a taking up of the manhood into God. This doctrine preserves the proper teaching of God. Second, this creed teaches that Christ is truly of Mary's flesh and blood. A new body was not created and implanted, but he took up flesh, Christ took up flesh in her womb. Mary is not a surrogate, but she is the mother of God. This preserves the doctrine of Christ as true man. The third point, Christ never ceases to be flesh and blood. This will come as a surprise to some. Flesh and blood is what he joined himself to forever. If you kicked Jesus' shins, now at God's right hand, he would say, Ow! This preserves the teaching that the two became one and are inseparable and indivisible. One person, Jesus at the resurrection or the ascension, does not cease to be also true man. 
While this is incomprehensible to us that God and man could be one, it is compared by the Church Fathers in the Creed to the fact of how we too are a combination of two things, soul and body, yet are one person. Fourth, the joining of the two natures into one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not a commingling, creating a third type of mixture, which is neither man nor God, but a joining together of the two natures. Not that, as the fathers say, of two boards that could be pried apart, but truly one man who is and will always continue to be flesh and blood. Next, the creed teaches that there is a communication of attributes between the two natures, an interpenetration between these two natures in Christ. The ancients use the helpful image of fire and iron. The fire heats the iron and makes it glow, similarly how the divinity of Christ uh, enlivens and divinizes, in a way, the flesh of Christ, and yet they are separate. For we see in the Bible that Christ, with the touch of his flesh, healed. By the power not of the flesh, of course, but by the power of his divinity. And Christ, by the nature of the humanity, could die and did, yet only by the power and nature of the humanity. Because of the Incarnation, we can look at the cross and say these words, which are seemingly incomprehensible. Our God is dead. And finally, Jesus is true man. He had a soul and flesh as we do. It's not as if his mind was divine and implanted. He was like us in every way, as Hebrews says, yet without sin. All this... All these points, kind of back and forth, and the various heresies they represent that came in over the years, speak to the simple phrase in the creed, perfect God and perfect man. This teaching of the incarnation preserves the teaching of the atonement. What man needed, God did. God provided and accomplished man's salvation through the incarnation and death of his son. Now sometimes when you're driving home, you come out on a road and you say, oh, I I know where we are now. In the same way the Athanasian Creed ends as we come, as it were, out in the forest. Halfway through that section on the incarnation, we come to very familiar territory. The final section of this section ends the part about who Christ is, and switches over to what he did. We conclude the speaking about his being, and we finish with his acts. What did this God-man do? Well, we drive the car home. He suffered for our salvation. He descended into hell. He rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This creed confesses in conclusion that salvation rests only in this triunity of persons. And the second person who became man. The creed quietly concludes with that refrain, that little orchestra piece piece that dances throughout the creed where we started a month ago. This is the Catholic faith. The final verse says, whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. And what is our response as we hear those words? We bow the head, and we bow the knee, and we say, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.